how to identify people and devices um, and then after the coffee break I will talk about how to deal with keys. So what we want to look at is how this edge authentication, understand what it is um, and what are limitations of the basic things because we still all use passwords today, right? And people have been predicting the end of the password a long time ago. Um, I think Bill Gates more than 20 years ago announced the end of the password but we have more and more passwords and so there is some indications to believe that this may finally end but still for now we have to deal with lots of passwords and also we look at what happens when you deploy protocols in practice and then for the second part we look at key establishment so this is my way to present the goals in cryptography um, so you have confidentiality um, of and authentication, these are the two um, main goals you want to separate and there you make a distinction between confidentiality of data and of entities and so Claudia will speak on anonymity and how you can hide entities today we'll speak about authentication of entities and cryptographers call this identification it's a bit unfortunate because computer security people like Frank Pieces they say giving your username is identification and giving your password is authentication that's computer security people cryptographers we say identification is proving who you are or it's a bit ambiguous because we know that the other guys have a different definition so we suggest that you call it entity authentication and it's clear that you authenticate an entity because you can also authenticate a key you can authenticate a device you can authenticate many things so when we want to deal with entities we speak of entity authentication we can of course do many more things in cryptography, but we'll skip it for now. So the problem is easy and we'll come back to it. Then we look at passwords, we look at challenge response, which go back actually to World War II, uh, with symmetric key, then with public key schemes, and then you will hear about more advanced schemes, how this is actually being deployed more and more um, in the second part. And I will say a few things on biometrics, but I leave most of this to Enrique uh, for this afternoon. So the problem is very easy. Um, somebody shows up and says, hi, I'm Alice. And the question that Bob asks is, why should I believe that this is actually Alice? How do you know you deal with certain entity? This is important if you want to enter a building or if you want to withdraw money in the bank or if you want to cross a border. And of course, if you log into a computer or if you log into your mobile phone. So it's a very important concept for users but also for devices remember we're going to have these 50 billion devices how will you keep track which is which that's a very big challenge so i give you a formal or more formal definition well formal a definition which is a bit more explicit from the handbook of applied cryptography uh, which is by the way a free book you can download it's a bit out of date but the basic concept of course have not changed there have been some new algorithms invented and new protocols, but the basic principles are very well explained there and you can download this for free. So, anti authentication means that you're convinced of the identity of another party and the fact that this party is alive during the protocol, is active during the protocol. So in fact, as we will see, passwords don't even provide this because a password can be intercepted and resent and in, in fact, by looking at the password, you can check whether it's correct or not, but you don't even know whether this was sent recently or just captured and reset. So, to remember the importance or remind you of the importance of liveliness, um, I can tell you kind of a bizarre story that was in the newspaper um, a while ago in South Africa. Um, in South Africa, many people still don't know how to write. So if they collect their pension, then they use their fingerprint to, uh, they go to the post office and they give their fingerprint to prove that they collected their pension of this month. So what happened, you can imagine somebody passed away, but the family members still wanted to collect the pension. So they took the dead body in between them and they actually went to the post office and used the finger to actually still claim the pension for this month. Okay, so this shows you that if you authenticate somebody, you actually want to check liveliness as well. It's not enough to just check uh, that some property is there. So, literature says already for a long time that authenticating somebody is based on something you know, 
and here's a pin code for your banking applications um, or maybe for your mobile phone um, or password to log in something you have because we have more and more devices and initially these were bank cards or these access cards to enter buildings so this is something you have and this is used to let me into the parking lot or let me into my office um, but of course we have more and more other devices and as you will see more and more we'll try to use our mobile phones to actually um, have something you have this is a new thing and then finally you also have biometrics something you are so you try to use uh, properties of people um, initially it was mostly fingerprint today there is systems based on retina iris and so on um, this is evolving and what you see more and more is behavioral biometrics so your smartphone now has so many sensors that actually it can monitor you the whole time it knows how you hold your phone it knows how many times you typically check your email it knows it knows how you click on the apps whether you push hard or not and which finger you use so your phone will learn everything about you and based on this it will know that it's you that's working with the phone and similarly um, in our homes our homes will learn our behavior um, and based on this they will know whether or not there is an intruder of course that assumes that your behavior is more or less consistent and you don't start doing strange things but this is clearly a trend made possible by more and more sensors and by cheaper cost of uh, processing of course it also has privacy implications and then more and more also location is being used to find out who you are um, this was already in the old days when you were using um, dial-up systems I guess many of you are too young to remember this but there were these modems over the phone lines and in fact the phone bill was very high but was one reason that you didn't want to do this but the other thing that was were hackers doing this so there was a system where you would dial the number and the number would dial you back so the bill was paid by the company and this served officially as authentication although it could be spoofed very easily you can read about that it's not very secure um, but we see more and more also um, of course wireless being used for location Google does this um, we can use GSM because our mobile companies know where we are um, but also Galileo so um, you may remember that um, a long time ago the Americans said to the Europeans I hope you know that if you no longer are friends you can switch off GPS uh, when the satellites fly above Europe and then you will be cooked and the Europeans said oops we have to make our own system so they built Galileo and the Americans said we're just kidding just kidding but the Europeans say well we'll better have our own system so we now have our own system and one of the things we want to do there is authenticate location because uh, actually GPS can be spoofed um, I showed you yesterday how the Iranians uh, brought down a drone by spoofing GPS and so location will become also more and more important and so back to passwords so the concept is very simple you just invent a complex password or some companies even give you a very complex password um, and then in the server there is a database with users and usernames and passwords um, and we use it all the time because it's cheap if you start a new company with a new service on the web or a new mobile service and you want to register your users well just use passwords because if you say well click here and put your mail address and send us three euros we'll send you a special token which then you can whatever by that time you will not get many customers and as you know the game today is to get millions of customers quickly and that you do with passwords because it's fast quick and cheap and users know about it of course passwords are really not suitable for the internet they were suitable for the system they were designed for this was mainframes okay mainframes were computers about the size of the podium here or maybe the size of this room and they were in kind of specially protected buildings and you could go work on the mainframe uh, first by submitting your punch cards on a punch card machine and then later with a terminal which was hooked up and you could see the wire from your terminal going into the mainframe and with that kind of setting passwords were okay but then suddenly passwords were used over local air networks and now over the internet so one problem of course is that passwords can be easily guessed because many password lists have been hacked and then we found out that a substantial number of people have password as password and one two three four five six as password and so on so most people are not capable of choosing good passwords passwords can be intercepted so if you send them in clear over your LAN or if you use telnet and I can tell you if you look at the legacy system you go into any large company and look at all their systems they all will still have telnet somewhere available and in telnet your password is just sent in clear over the internet okay 
Um, and then, of course, the other thing is that Bob has your secret. So this means that if you want to get usernames and passwords, you set up a stupid service on the internet, um, which shows something like dancing pigs or funny cats. And you say, if you want more of these pictures, then you actually have to give a username and password. And users then give the username and password to their choose one, the one they use everywhere, right? And so now you have suddenly also their pair. So this is an inherent lim limitation of passwords. And then finally, of course, you have this database. And this database can be breached. I showed you breaches yesterday, and so there are already databases of millions of passwords being breached, which is very good for security research because we can study how people choose passwords. But it's not so good for the victims. Um, and there is actually online also websites that show you, uh, you can check yourself whether your password has already been breached. Um, but so the main problem of passwords is that it does not check liveliness. It does, it's not really matching our definition of authentication because the password can always be intercepted and reset. Even if it's encrypted, you can just keep the ciphertext and send it later. So it's actually a big fail. But um, in the references at the back of the slides, I put a very interesting article. Um, <coughs> there was a study done about 10 years ago that actually looked at all the alternatives and showed why most of them have some flaw that actually makes it very difficult to replace passwords. So I think, on the other hand, technology has now moved further again. We're again, uh, this article is, I think, eight or 10 years old. I think now technology is changing. And finally, we may get rid of passwords in the next five years, which means that for some applications which really matter, you will no longer use passwords. But I can predict that probably in 10 years, you still have 20 passwords to deal with many cheap services, because I'm not sure we're going to get rid of them completely. So very quickly, people propose small improvements to passwords. And one improvement is that you don't store the password in the computer, but you store the hash value of a password. So you just put the password in a one-way function, and you store the result in the computer. And this has now a big advantage, which means if this database is breached, well, the passwords are not there, only the hashes. Of course, if your password is 123456, it's not going to help you, because the hacker will hash 123456 and we'll actually find out that this is a password. So it's not helping much. But I think um, a while ago, LinkedIn got actually um, hacked and they had hashed passwords. So you kind of, as a user, you had some time, you knew you probably had a few hours to change your password um, because the hackers didn't have all the passwords. They had to first do a search um, through big lists and they could only recover probably some of the passwords. So it's a very big improvement with a very modest cost. Now, you can do a simple computation of um, password entropy. So we, as you know, cryptographers express security lengths in key bits. Um, and I looked here at 5 to 10 characters. And then we have here on the left lowercase, lowercase and digits, mixed case and digits, and the full keyboard. By the way, that doesn't really work because probably control S is also there. And then you hang up your connection. So this is very optimistic. But so you see, if you have 10 characters full keyboard, which is probably com completely impossible to remember, you end up with something like a 64-bit key. If you take something more reasonable, say lowercase and digits, seven characters, you end up with a 36-bit key. So a 40-bit key was probably still OK in the 80s. Today, it's a joke. So the problem is that computers have gotten faster. So Probably from Vincent's lecture, you know that keys should be 128 bits today. Or maybe for some applications which are not too important, 80 bits is good. But everything below 70 bits is really not serious. Okay, So computers got faster, but our brain didn't get better. So we still can only remember passwords which are about 30 to 40 bits. Okay, So the response by sysadmins and security people is to make ever more complex password rules. But this slide shows you this is hopeless. Right? What the only thing you do by forcing complex passwords is making users' life miserable. Okay? And in, in the end, for hackers, it doesn't matter. Whether it's 35-bit keys or 45-bit keys or 28-bit keys, um, if they can get such a key, they have the right infrastructure for it, it's a matter of seconds. Okay? So you actually have to change your system rather than annoy your users. I think that's a very important message. Um, and then, of course, the worst is people actually usually choose passwords from dictionaries. So these entropy calculations are much worse. There is lots of dictionaries online. And 
if you put all dictionaries you can find about movie stars and rock stars and and whatever you and, and all languages you can see used in your building probably end up with a few billion passwords which you can also guess very quickly so further improvements have been made to passwords um, this is all again still 70s so it's not very uh, novel is to call it's called salting so in salting what you do is you don't only store the username you also store a salt so this salt is public information and it's hashed together with the password now why you do this well every user now has a different password hashing function and so if you want to test whether a user has password 123456 then you have to do it for every user separately because every user has their own salt and so this means that Finding a password does not become easier if there is more users. You have to do for every user a separate attack. So again, it buys you a little bit, and the cost is very modest. You just have to store say, 64 or 128-bit salt. This is public information. So you don't have to store secrets, you just store a salt. And most good password systems actually do this. So to prevent attacks on all users at the same time, you can do it for, you have to use it for every user separately. So you have to choose which user you want to attack at a very low cost of storing some public information. So just for your information, for historic purposes, because now we use very different functions, uh, this is what Unix did in the 70s and 80s. So if you saw Vincent lecture, you would not be surprised. They were still using DES because there was no AES in the 70s and 80s. And so what they did was they used the password as a DES key, so it was only 56 bits. But if you took away the difficult to type characters, there were only 48 bits left at most. Um, interestingly, they would actually apply DES 25 times to make it slower, to make it actually harder to test the password guess. And on the mainframe in the 70s, 25 times DES probably took something like half a second. So verifying a password took quite a while. There was a salt, which was changing something in DES, was only 12 bits, which today would say is not big enough. Um, but I don't think people could imagine there would be more than 100 users on a single system or so. So that was, that was thought was enough to have uh, 4,000 different salts. Of course, today, if you write better code for DES and PCs are faster, you can test hundreds of millions of passwords per second. And so you can run to your database again in seconds. So this would not be a good system. And then there is something else which is a bit more advanced. I will not explain the details, but there is something called time memory trade-offs. And in fact, you can search through all the passwords or all the keys, but you can also do some pre-computation, store some clever information, and then you can find the next key a lot faster. This makes no sense if you want to recover one key, because the computation you do in advance is as much as recovering um, the password or the key. But if you want to recover many keys, like the NSA or a hacker, then you do a big computation once, you store some information, and then you can find a password or key quickly. So in the case of Unix, you have to do about 25 to the 56 per salt, which is not too much today. You can do this easily with the cloud. You store about two terabytes per salt, and then you can actually recover one key or one password in time two to the 38 times a small constant. So this is something of less than a second. So you may have seen online services that help you to recover Windows or Excel passwords. They use a similar technique. So they once do all the effort to do all the calculations, they store a few hundreds of terabytes of data, and based on this, they can actually recover your key. They charge you $100 for it, but they only take a second of computation to find your key. And this is something people overlook. So in fact, if you, use, if you don't use a separate key per user, or if your salt space is too small, in fact, a 100-bit key becomes a 66-bit key. So it's times two-thirds. An 80-bit key becomes a 45-bit key or 50-bit key. Even a 128-bit key is only an 88-bit key. So you should take this into account when choosing key lengths if your system will have many users. So rather than getting rid of passwords, people have been trying to improve things. And so a natural improvement is to not apply DES 25 times or the function today people use MD5 or some other things, but to apply it a million times. Okay, and so what happens now is that testing a password takes longer, but for example, if you do MD5 today, it takes four cycles per byte. So it's less than 1,000 cycles to do a full MD5. So you can easily do it 
a million times and you use a billion cycles on your computer to actually check a password, which is okay, right? It's a few hundred milliseconds. And so the idea is we can't make people remember longer keys, but we can make the password hashing slower. And so in the end, if you want to recover a password, you still have to do a lot of work. That's a very clever idea. Um, it's just a bit annoying if you have a large company uh, like Google or Facebook and you have thousands of people logging in per second, then you have to fill a room like this with servers only to do password hashing, which they find a bit of a waste. So typically you will see that the large players don't like this because they find it too intensive to do all these calculations. Um, and then there has been some research um, on slow password hashing because it turns out and you'll see in the Bitcoin lecture later this week that actually by using special hardware, ASICs, you can actually speed up hashing a lot and you can make it very efficient. So people have been doing a lot of research to make hash functions which you cannot speed up with ASICs. So the idea is that you cannot gain because it uses a lot of memory accesses. And if you build an ASIC with memory accesses, a lot of memory accesses, you actually have to build your processor, your memory, and a very big network in between. And then your ASIC becomes not much more efficient, or maybe only 10 times more efficient than a PC, rather than 100 or 1,000 times. So this is what is done in this PBKDF2, S-Crypt, B-Crypt, Argon2, Balloon. There is like a lot of schemes. It's a very exciting research area because there is theory or something else than practice, and these people are arguing about who is right. So it's really fascinating. So we still don't know how to prove that something is really hard to optimize in an ASIC. There is quite some interesting and challenging research, but there is an interesting gap also between theory and practice. But so there are now very interesting functions to use though, to make password hashing slow, to actually make passwords more secure. Of course, what you then do is you cannot use the same hashed file on your Raspberry Pi and on your cloud infrastructure. Right? Because the Raspberry Pi will then take three hours to hash your password. And this is not so pleasant to have to wait three hours to log in, especially if you then mistyped and you have to wait another three hours. So this is a, an advantage of the Unix system was you could just copy this asset password file everywhere. So here, if you make the function very slow, then it will not work on very small devices. You have to tune the function by the device and then it should be a different function. Now, as I mentioned, the large internet players don't like this because it takes them too much computational power. So what they use is something people call Pepper. There was a salt, which is public. They call Pepper, um, but I think it's just a secret key. So it's a bit confusing. It's just a secret key. And what you do is you apply actually a Mac algorithm to the password. That now means you have to store a key somewhere in a server. You have to send your passwords over. They have to be Mac there and come back. And so if the server goes down, you can't log anybody in. If this, this key is in an HSM, if this HSM dies, then you're cooked, so you have to have a second HSM, and so on. Plus, you create a single point of failure, which is this one secure server, uh, which you hope is not being hacked. So a couple of years ago at Real World Crypto, um, Facebook explained what their password hashing algorithm is, and it's a very good message to people from academia to show what the mass people in the industry sometimes make. Um, so what they first do is they use MD5 with salt and password. It's probably the system that they invented when Facebook was created. Then they realized it was not very secure, so they added bcrypt, which is a slow password hash fun function. But the result of bcrypt is a bit too big, and then they applied SHA-2 to the result. So we call this a spaghetti design. Um, <laughs> so and I think it's an interesting question, why they didn't start over, right? They could actually um, dump MD5, and just use a more modern function and have one hash function. But then you should think about this. If Facebook want to change this algorithm, what they could do here is they could apply more hashing themselves without involving the user. If you want to change the function completely, you have to ask every user to log in and give your password again. But Facebook doesn't like this because then it would be obvious that a large percentage of their users are no longer existing or no longer using you. They don't respond. So their user base would shrink probably by 10 or 20%. So rather than having this hit on the user base, they actually decided to do a hit in complexity and hash everything uh, three times. So this is where business overrules security or simplicity. So for those of you who are into passwords, you could easily give a lecture of another hour on passwords, but I will not do that. Uh, but there's been quite some noise because NIST, the National Institute for Standards and Technology, 
So these are the ones who standardize AES and SHA-2 and SHA-3 and, and so on. They actually publish lots of useful documents on cybersecurity, guidelines and so on. And one of them is about digital identity. And so it was updated two years ago and made quite some noise because the advice they give is make passwords easy to remember and hard to guess, so let users use passphrases and the first letter of those. Don't mandate special characters because it's too burdensome on users. Um, be very generous in the size you allow, but also the, the recommendation that made the most noise was they say, stop password expiration. They say a password should not be changed. If it's properly used, it actually can be used for a very long time. Um, so especially policies where passwords have to be changed every month, they call them all as crazy. That's what the document doesn't say, but I think between the lines you can read that. So of course, only change after compromise. You can of course argue, how do you know it's compromised? If you typed in the wrong place, but at least it's a very good message to your sysadmin if you're fed up with passwords that have to be changed every six weeks or four weeks or three weeks or, or eight or, or whatever. So more or less the advice is now, if you, if you use that careful, it's okay to keep a password for a few years. And don't force people to change them every month. And that's recommendations from NIST, if you don't believe me. And they also encourage password managers. So you should be able to copy and paste in password fields uh, so for passwords that are very hard to type. So it's quite of a change. If you would look at the previous version of this document, they would actually say very different things. But so some wisdom has come in there. Um, and for example, another advice is allow users to write down their passwords. Because the hackers on the internet, they can't look in your wallet. Right? Of course, if you lose your wallet, then somebody will find your passwords. And if you then don't write for which account it is, it's still not so easy to use it. Okay, so the, the vision or the view on what you should do with passwords has changed um, quite a lot. So one thing you can do is to expand memory is to just write this password or this key on a Mac stripe or on a USB stick or on a hard disk. And then of course you can remember very long keys. Of course the problem is that you now identify the device. If I lose my USB key then I can be impersonated or if I lose my card. So this doesn't solve the problem completely. It just shifts the problem to storing it on a device. There is another technique which we'll discuss in more detail later, but it's using fixed certificates. So what you do is you actually produce a statement signed by a central party of your name, your serial number, and a validity period. So it's a bit like an identity card or a passport without key material. And so the nice thing is that it stops people from creating new entities in the system, from creating fake bank accounts, fake user accounts, because you can only create an account when it's signed with the private key of the CA. And so you can verify at the verification site, you only need the public key of the CA. So at the verification site, you don't need secret information. Now, for example, your ID card and your passport have such a file, also your credit card has such a file. So this is very nice because it prevents creating of fake passports. It makes the life of the CIA very hard because the CIA doesn't have this key, so it cannot create a new passport as they could before when it was all paper-based. Of course, this has a serious flaw, which is you can copy it into a different passport. So you cannot create new fields, but you can of course read out this field with a simple reader and write it in another passport. And ideally, of course, you also sign the photo and then you have to get a different photo on the passport and then the guy at the border may see that the photo does not match the photo in the signed statement. That's the idea. Okay, but so it's a simple measure that is easy to verify, no secrecy verification, uh, but it's easy to spoof. And for example, this system was used as security measure in the UK EMV credit cards in the 90s. And then of course some research from Cambridge showed you can actually copy this file to a different card and then get money anyway. So it's not enough to stop real fraud, but it's enough to make it hard to create new entities in the system, which is also valuable by itself. And then we go back to go, go, go one step further and systems with challenge response. So this is more and more used, especially um, to log into banking applications, but also people in companies used to use it more and more with separate devices. Now it's switching to mobile phones. So you get more or less a random number being asked and you have some key in a device, and this device also has some cryptography that can be a secure ID token or a Vasco token 
or it can be a smart card and then it will actually compute a MAC on this question. And so a MAC is an unpredictable function of the key and the input. And so this actually solves most of the problems of passwords, um, which means that if you eavesdrop the communication, well, you find the MAC, but next time there will be a different question and a different answer. So it's called challenge response. It was invented in World War II to identify planes, to know which ones to shoot and not to shoot. Uh, but so it got rolled out, for example, in the secure ID tokens. Also, if you using the bank systems in Belgium, if you have these small boxes where you put your cart in, also a Mac is being generated. It's the same mechanism is being used, actually. So it's a very good solution. It's, of course, not so user friendly because the user has to type in this random number and then type in the Mac. So this is tiring. Right? So you can, of course, plug it in um, to your PC with the USB interface. But then if malware sits on the PC, the malware can do all the manipulation. So this is why it's probably better to have a separate device. So but this checks liveliness and is fine. Um, if you use the secure ID tokens or the Vasco tokens, so, so most of them you don't type a random number because actually the random number is the time. Well, it actually doesn't have to be random. It should be and not repeating. And the time typically doesn't repeat. So what you do is you just send a <laughs> mic of the time and you have now a password that's valid for 30 seconds or 60 seconds or two minutes. Okay, so then of course you have to have clever tricks. What happens if the clocks is synchronized and so on? So this becomes a bit more tricky, but there are solutions. By the way, some research has also showed that this is also used in EMV, um, so in payments, um, that some bank terminals kept generating the same random number over and over. Of course, then you're cooked. Same thing in GSM, by the way. In GSM, this is used to authenticate you, and in 3G and 4G. And so what happened is that if you're abroad, your operator doesn't send your key, say, to Italy, but actually it sends only the questions and the answers. It turns out that some operators abroad keep using the same question and answer because they're too lazy to ask for new questions and answers. So it shows that even if the mechanism is secure, if you repeat the R, if you use the R, of course, then it becomes not much more secure than passwords. Then you can intercept and replay. Next step is using public key. And this became possible um, in the mid 90s when the first smart cards appeared that could do RSA operations. Um, what you then do is you get again a random number as question. This is actually what's used in EMV specs, the credit card specs. Um, Mike Ward will speak about those on Thursday. So you actually send a random number and then your card will compute a signature on this random number with this private key. And this will be verified with the public key um, of the user. So now you actually solved all the problems of passwords because keys are now long private keys that cannot be guessed. Um, there is every time a new question and a new answer. So eavesdropping the communication will not help you to learn the next answer. Okay. And the nice thing is that at Bob's side, there is no more secrets. Bob only has the public key of all the users. This is a bit a scalability problem. We'll talk about this after the coffee break, how to solve this. But more or less, you now have solved all the problems and Bob no longer has secrets. So Bob is now sure that he talked to Alice and then to verify this, he actually does not need any secret information. So there is actually a better solution to this. Um, it was discovered in 1986 in the paper of Fiat and Shamir and this paper um, was called How to Prove Yourself. Solution to the identification problem. And this is where cryptographers started calling this identification because of this 1986 paper. And I will skip the details, but more or less you have a commitment first. So the first card sends something. Then there is a challenge being sent and then there is a response. Okay. And so the nice thing about these three step protocols is that now you can actually prove that Bob only learns that he speaks to Alice. So these protocols can be made First, hard to cheat. So if you don't know the secret key, you can't complete, complete this protocol. Um, but actually, if Bob is malicious and try to ask strange questions to learn something about private key, you can actually prove by the way, this is not possible. You can prove that Bob is sure he spoke to Alice. But actually, he can't convince anybody else he did. And so this is actually very nice um, if you want to do voting. 
um, or if you want to attribute risk protection to many things. For example, if you vote, you want to prove that you voted for three out of six people or two out of six, but not more, without revealing who you voted for. And these kind of techniques are being used here as well. So here you prove you know a secret key, but without revealing it. And the mathematical technique to show that this works is that actually Bob can produce the whole interaction without involving Alice. Um, it's possible if he changed the order, he first produces the answer and then the commitment and the question. And that's in a nutshell what zero knowledge does. So it gives you more mathematical assurance that even by asking clever questions, Bob cannot learn anything about the private key of Alice. Now, the, the reason why Fiat and Shamir proposed this was not particularly for this property, but was because this was more efficient than RSA. So in fact, these protocols could be implemented in smart cards in the 80s, and they were implemented in Kamal Plus. So if you use Kamal Plus pay TV in the late 80s, early 90s, they actually used this protocol because it only required squarings and multiplications rather than a full exponentiation. And so it could be done in a smart card um, seven years before we could put RSA in a smart card. And that's why these protocols became important. If you think about it, the financial sector hates zero knowledge because the terminal is sure that they have seen Alice, but the terminal has no proof afterwards that it has seen Alice. Because in fact, it has a transcript, it has a session, but anybody can produce this session as well. To the session itself is no proof. So people have been trying to sell to the banks their knowledge and say it's more efficient, but they don't understand what the banks don't want this. The banks want a proof afterwards that you were there. They don't want some the fact that you can deny that you ever have been involved in the process. So this is what the knowledge on the one hand is fantastic for cryptography. We can use it in many ways, but it's really terrible for authentication if you want evidence afterwards. So this is kind of summarized in this slide. Um, the properties we have. So everything except for passwords protect against guessing. Liveliness, once you have an interaction, liveliness is actually being achieved. If, of course, you store a key on a max stripe or you store a certificate on a max stripe, you don't have liveliness. Impersonation by Bob is being stopped and secrets for Bob once you have public key technology. Um, and then only in zero knowledge you have a mathematical proof that you learn nothing about the secrets of Alice. But you pay a price for this, which is Bob cannot prove his own Alice. Okay, so. I will skip the biometrics part and I will go to, in my last five minutes, on practical things. So one is the phishing problem, the fact that people get emails or links being sent in social media and they actually are convinced to enter their password or credentials or even to run a complex protocol because it's not only passwords, any clever protocol, if you're phished, actually people ask you to authenticate and it's used somewhere else. Um, what about losing your device? What about sharing devices? Uh, what about interruption? And what about distance bounding? So this is still lots of problems when you're implementing things in practice. So the first thing is phishing. So phishing, you actually authenticate to the wrong person. If you think about it, my whole lecture was how Alice can prove to Bob she's Alice. But of course, Bob also has to prove to Alice that he's Bob. So it has to work both ways and we call this Mutual authentication. Now, this is easy for devices. It's very hard to convince users of something. If I'm the real Bob, I will make some, some field in the browser green. Yeah, sure. Nobody can do that, right? I mean, how do you convince to a user that you are actually the right person? You can't expect that the user will check very long, complex strings or do cryptographic com computations in their head. So this is an interesting problem. Um, and also, Having mutual authentication is not the same as running twice in natural authentication. You actually have to link the two authentications in some clever way. So but the difficult part is users have to make decisions and users are really bad at this. Okay, you can train them, but sometimes even experts can't make the right decision about whether something is correct or not. So another problem is as soon as you start using a device with cryptography, whatever it is, if you lose the device, then of course, the person who finds it can use it to break in. So you always want to add a step to authenticate the user to the device. And for this, we use in the banking world a PIN, or also in our mobile phone. Maybe the mobile phone is used for banking. Hopefully, a decent protocol is being used. 
But before you can use your phone, you should actually use a pin or maybe biometrics. Now, very interestingly, you have to be very careful when you put these things together. This is a paper from uh, nine years ago from the Cambridge team on EMV. So in EMV, you have many options. So EMV is the credit card payment system made by European MasterCard and Visa. Actually, it was designed mostly in Belgium by MasterCard teams. And I did quite some reviews for them as well. But the Cambridge team spotted a very clever attack because you can actually use EMV with chip and pin as we do in Europe. But in the US, they use chip and sign in the UK as well, which means the chip is used for authentication, but you also sign on a piece of paper. And now what the attack, what was discovered is very simple. You put some small chip in between the stolen credit card and the terminal and the small chip. So when it gets the question, because what happens if you do a payment, you enter your pin, this pin is sent to the terminal to the card and the card checks the pin. So that it doesn't go online and the terminal doesn't know how to check. It doesn't know you don't your pin. It's checked on the card. So this device in the, here gets the pin, so you enter just any pin. The driver gets the pin, it doesn't check it. This device in the middle tells the card, today we do chip and sign. We only do a single chip. And then it says the pin was okay. okay. So what happens is now the terminal believes that the pin was okay and believes that the pin was checked by the card. The card believes that the merchant will actually check the signature. Okay, and this actually worked in practice. And in France, people spotted credit cards. The police found credit cards with a second device glued on it that actually executed this attack. So this app and this device was seen in the, in the field three years after publication. So we now know the mafia reads our papers. That's good news. <laughs> At least somebody reads our papers. <laughs> so biometrics. So I will leave this to Enrique. So the idea there is that you to prevent the attack where people give on their password or device to their secretary or their friend or whatever whoever replaces them this is a very good feature in real life because sometimes you have to go on vacation you have to do it but of course from a security policy point of view it's really very bad and so biometrics can prevent this and the other reason why people like it is of course it's more user friendly now i'm not a big fan of biometrics because i think it has many problems but we'll have to discuss two more problems and then we're done with this lecture so if you look at the network setting, you can run whatever protocol you want, whatever clever protocol. If somebody afterwards takes over the session, it doesn't really help, right? <coughs> so if you log in with a complex protocol and then I jam your communication, your wireless, and I send now to the base station, well, I can do anything I want. So in a remote setting, you don't want and authentication, what you want is authenticated key establishment. So what you do is you authenticate the party and you agree on a key and then this key is used to encrypt and authenticate all the communication. And this stops hijacking after initial authentication. So in fact, authentication is only good for scenarios where you're close to the device that authenticates you. If you're remote, the primitive you want is authenticated key establishment. And we will speak about that after the break. So we'll end up with some funny pictures. I'm not really a military fan, but it's a very nice example of an attack that we also see more and more in the wild. Um, this is the war between Angola and South Africa. Pictures are a story told in Ross Emerson's book. So you have, of course, these fancy warplanes in South Africa and the World War II planes used by Angola. And so, of course, what these anti-aircraft uh, missiles do is they try to find out whether you're an Angolese plane or a South African plane, because you only want to shoot the other guy's plane, not your own planes. So there is a challenge response protocol, um, and if you give the right answer, you don't get a rocket shot at you. So you better get it correct. So what happens if the people from Angola wanted to take some revenge after a bombing raid of South Africa? So they would fly to the border, they would get a challenge, and they wouldn't know the answer, obviously, because they didn't have the keys. So they would be shot at. They didn't like that, so they actually forwarded the question to a nearby Angolese station that found a nearby South African plane that asked the same question. <laughs> and the plane would actually give the answer and it would be forwarded back, and so this is how they actually made it past the board. <laughs> and so the same trick actually is being applied uh, to steal cars now. You see these videos on the internet where people come with a device to your front door, hoping that you put your key somewhere near the front door, and then the second guy has the device next to the car, and in fact, the car believes that the key is nearby and so they can drive off with the car. Okay, so this is actually, again, something which is described in papers in the 80s and 90s. And now you can device, buy devices in China that do this stuff for you. And so to stop this, actually, it's pretty hard. Uh, we work on this um, already for a long time. We now have a collaboration with iMac on this, with iMac Netherlands. 
So what you do is distance bounding, you try to establish that the other party is nearby by doing fast exchanges and by using other properties of the physical channel. But um, I'm going to stop here and I'm going to hand over to Ruhl, who will discuss uh, more advanced topics. And while Ruhl is setting up, you can still ask questions. Thank you.